I'm Dave Sofer. This is reading number 11, the next to the last one, of J.C.'s World, a series that I've been doing from the book The Reverend Mr. J.C. When Appearances Are Not Enough that I wrote a couple of years ago. I've been doing it for the Washington Free Public Library during this time of quarantine. So maybe you're a captive audience. If so, I hope your captivity has been pleasant. Thanks for joining me. Nurse Maggie Potter was the helper the Reverend Mr. J.C. desperately needed. Who knew that she would become so much a part of Parsonage life during Pastor James' illness? We continue with our story. J.C. woke in the middle of the night, not sure what waked him. Maggie was downstairs with James, but something made him put on his robe and head down the steps. He met Maggie coming up. John... I think this is it. James is asking for you. No more words were exchanged as they went down the stairs and into James' bedroom where the old pastor lay. He had changed so much so quickly in the last few weeks. He had little or no appetite, hardly any strength, didn't sleep well. Maggie sat down in her regular spot at the head of his bed and James' hand reached out for hers. J.C. pulled up a chair so that his knees were almost touching Maggie's. This was not the first time J.C. had experienced a death. He had dealt with those deaths by leaning on his developing faith. Faith is hard to develop. Faith calls for trust in things that often can't be seen or touched. Christians believe in life after death. The promise Jesus brought that when our bodies die, There'll be a better place waiting for us. Intellectually, he knew those things. But trusting in the promises and taking courage from them was a different story. J.C. found it hard to let go. To think about himself or someone else not being on the earth, to laugh and talk. James Edwards had paid his taxes. He'd cleaned his plate. He'd given money to missions to help the orphans in Africa. Now he was going to die. Why wasn't James upset? Why wasn't he mad? Why wasn't he bitter? J.C. knew that he was in pain, but James just lay there with Maggie holding his hand. Then he spoke. John? Yes, James. Maggie and I need you to do something for us. Talking that much tired him out, so he looked at Maggie and she continued. John, you know James and I have become very close over these months. We love each other. And while it's a shame that we couldn't have met and fallen in love years ago, we didn't. And now we have. James and I have spent hours and hours sharing everything on our minds and in our hearts. I see in James a hard worker who will undertake any job that anybody asks. But that's not the half of it. It's why he does those things. His ministry came about because he believes the teachings of Jesus are very clear. To love our neighbor and to do unto others. And when you get inside and know the gentleness and the love, then you see God in the eyes and the heart of this man. James spoke again. What Maggie says she sees in me is what I see in her ministry which she calls nursing. So John, he continued, we want what some people would consider very silly. I don't have long to live and we would feel better if we were joined together by more than just our conversation and our love. John, would you, would you? Worn out with the words, James looked again at Maggie, who said, would you marry us? She hurried on. We know we won't have a license, and we know in the eyes of the law that it won't have any legal effect, and we don't care about that. We know and we care about what God thinks, so that's what we want you to do. And we'd hoped we'd be able to wait until Ruth and maybe even Jill could be here to witness our spiritual union. But John, I'm not only just a woman who has found the love of my life. I'm a woman of science and medicine, and I think, James told me he knows, 
that we don't have time to wait. The room was more dark than light. After Maggie had finished talking, there were no sounds, and both sets of eyes looked at him. J.C. wanted to cry. He wanted to utter hope, though he knew it would be false. He wanted to say all the things that he had said over the years to avoid death, its horribleness, its nearness. In that split second, as he thought about their request, he thought the way to do it would be go upstairs and dress to give honor and respect to God as he'd always been taught, to avoid this deep, dark hour in the middle of the night, hoping for a brighter time in the morning. But they were still looking at him. Once again, for one of the few times in J.C.'s life, he was being called upon to be the adult. He was being called on to do things that he wanted to run away from, to acknowledge things that he didn't want to happen. He let his breath out, and only then realized he'd been holding it. He stopped thinking his own thoughts and looked at Maggie and James. They were looking at him expectantly. He blurted out, I'll be back, and left the room. The stairs of the parsonage were familiar, by now he'd been up and down them so many times he didn't have to think where he was going. As he walked, unseeing, he prayed. He talked to God. I don't know what to do, God. I don't want to hurt either of their feelings, but how can this be a good thing? If James dies, then Maggie's alone, and she will have made these promises, and James will have made these promises while knowing that he can't fulfill them. God, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. God, this isn't funny. It isn't a class at school. This isn't normal. He found himself in his bedroom in front of his closet. On the chest of drawers next to the closet door, there was a picture of him and Ruth taken on their honeymoon. He looked so happy and young, and he thought, I almost lost her. She loved me so much she was ready to let me go for me to find myself. What would my life have been like without her? And that's all James and Maggie are asking for, for their relationship to be honored. They just want to recognize it with each other. Automatically, his right hand reached out to select a shirt. It wouldn't take long to put on a suit, a shirt, and a tie to make it right. But what if James didn't have those few moments? In moments of stress, J.C.'s brain turned into a super ball, bouncing around crazily. He consciously stopped all of those thoughts, made his decision, went to his office and picked up the book of worship and went back downstairs. He hadn't realized how long he'd been gone, but it must have been a few minutes because both Maggie and James were looking at him with concern in their eyes. Maggie said, I wasn't sure you'd come back. James said, I was sure you would. J.C. sat and opened a book of worship to the ceremony of marriage. He had to modify it some on the fly because of the circumstances. And after a while, he found that the words he was using, though they were appropriate to the ceremony, were his own. There was a time that J.C. took great pride and great care in the reading of the ceremonies and rituals of the church. In seminary days, he'd even gone so far as to stand in front of a mirror and practice so that he could see his gestures as well as hear the fine diction and tones of his voice. But it's hard, very hard, to keep a ministerial tone and have perfect diction and be aware of your body language when you're dressed in pajamas and a bathrobe and your heart is so full of emotion. Somewhere in the midst of J.C.'s improvised wedding vows, Maggie and James became one. They melded together. And somewhere in the midst of this short ceremony declaring love, J.C. understood that he loved this man who had been gruff to him, sometimes a little mean in those early days. This man who expected J.C. to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, who expected him to baptize a little child and to clean the overflowing gutters of a house with the same attitude that all work, no matter how sweet or ugly, was the same in God's eyes. In the midst of his pronouncement of unity, 
J.C. knew he was going to miss this man like he'd never missed anyone before, but that someday he would be with James in paradise. At the end of the impromptu benediction, J.C. opened his eyes and looked at Maggie and James. It might have been a trick of light or maybe the moisture in his own eyes, but they looked as happy and silly and goofy as any just married couple had ever looked. J.C softly closed the book of worship and started to stand. Both Maggie and James said at the same time, Don't go. Stay with us. And so we did. And they talked of love. And they talked of Miss Kitty and her overflowing gutters. And Everett Harris and the darts team. And they talked of J.C.'s father and his relationship with James. And they talked of the cottage and Ruth and Jill's happiness with it. And they even managed to laugh a little bit about the dirty old Chevy pickup in the garage. And as they were talking about the time the sun came up, as quietly as he had lived his life, James Edwards went to meet his boss. Pastor James may have lived a quiet life, but he was one of the best known people in Prophetstown. Of course, everyone in town comes to his funeral to honor him. It's a beautiful time which ends with a private conversation between J.C. and Trinity Church Bishop Josiah Fry, a conversation that doesn't go quite as J.C. had thought it would. The bishop sounded like he was checking something off his list. Now about Sunday, J.C., first of all, you understand, don't you, that Ed and I will have to put our heads together and meet with the people of the church here to decide what to do about a pastor. That could take a few weeks. I know you've been doing most of the work while James has been sick. Can I ask you to carry on for a couple of weeks until we have that meeting? J.C. swallowed. Uh, sure, uh, yeah. Uh, not, not a problem, Bishop. Happy to. J.C. had thought that the pastorate would automatically come his way. After all, hadn't he been doing it? The thought of being associate to someone else's senior gave him a knot in his stomach. But maybe his time in purgatory was up and they would assign him someplace else. He had learned so much from James, and he knew he was different. Without saying any of this, he walked the bishop to his car. At the car, the bishop looked at him again, quizzically. He stuck out his big hand, thanked J.C. again for letting him be in the service, and drove off. With Pastor James absent, suddenly J.C.'s world looks very different. It was Friday the day after James Edwards' funeral. Here it was, 10 o'clock in the morning. The phone hadn't rung. The doorbell had not sounded. It was just too quiet in the parsonage. Ruth and Jill had gone back to Van Buren yesterday evening after the funeral, planning to return on Saturday. Maggie had gone home last night after a long hug and assurances that whatever each of them needed, the other would be there to provide. She promised to stay in touch and to come back in a few days to clean out her things from her temporary room in the parsonage. She said James had urged her to get away for some time after his passing. She thought in the next week or so she would visit some army nursing buddies she wanted to catch up with. This was the time of day that J.C. checked in on James, and he found himself going to James' room and being a little surprised that James wasn't there, even though he knew James wouldn't be. He went down to the basement shop, he thought maybe he'd work with his hands for a while, but there was too much of James there. He went upstairs to his office. There was really nothing to do. His sermon and the service for Sunday was finished. The information for the bulletin had been sent off to Lillian Coleman, the part-time church secretary, the only one who knew how to coax copies out of the church's ancient copier. He sat down in his wing-back chair in the corner to read a book. No focus. He needed some sort of physical release. So locking the house behind him, he walked to the cottage, let himself in, and was immediately sorry. Since the cottage had been given to the Wesleys, Ruth and Jill had been leaving things behind on their regular visits. There was too much Ruth, too much Jill. Now he was bored and lonely. Truth to tell, the Reverend Mr. J.C. Wesley, Associate Pastor of the Prophetstown Trinity Community Church, 
was feeling a little sorry for himself. When he'd first come to Prophetstown, every time he felt sorry for himself, James was standing there with another goat to milk. And soon, up to his knees in paint buckets or plumbing fixtures or shingles, J.C. was too busy to feel sorry for himself. But James Edwards wasn't standing there with a list. Ruth and Jill were not standing there to offer support and love. He couldn't stay at the cottage. He couldn't stay at the parsonage. And even though it was almost April, it was too early to play golf. He had always considered men who spent the afternoon playing cards and nursing beers in a tavern to be time wasters. And men without enough to do, that didn't appeal to him. He really couldn't go to a restaurant for lunch because there was so much food in the parsonage. Isn't it odd? that a man who used to hide in a spick-and-span office, deliberately avoiding human contact, certainly not wanting to be involved in any of the seedier, uglier sides of life, isn't it amazing that on this Friday, J.C. found himself feeling very much alone and sorry for himself because of it? He left the cottage and began to walk. And it felt like people were deliberately staying inside. He saw no one. He knew what they were doing, of course. They were intentionally not calling, not ringing the bell, not coming around to visit, because they were giving him space and time to grieve. He knew that intellectually, but oh, he wanted someone to talk to. Thinking of all these things, and honestly of his future, he walked until he found himself in Mrs. Hampton's park. He went to sit in the little arbor. He remembered when they'd first come to the little arbor of the park and how in his frustration he had talked to God. He remembered that it hadn't been very pleasant, but he'd been angry. J.C. had changed a lot in the time he'd been in Prophetstown, but old ingrained habits are hard to break. J.C. felt sorry for himself because it wasn't fair. And in his world, things should be fair. It wasn't fair that James Edwards died. It wasn't fair that his wife, whom he loved and appreciated more now than ever before, wasn't with him. It wasn't fair that for two years his daughter had done so much of her growing up with him not around. And it wasn't fair that yesterday the bishop hadn't told him that J.C. would take over the church in Prophetstown. That really wasn't fair. He'd busted fingernails. He'd worked until he had blisters. He'd held his tongue. He'd done everything that was expected of him. Yes, sometimes kicking and screaming, but he'd done it. What more did they want? It wasn't fair. J.C. was mad, but he didn't curse God. He didn't try to rationalize to God what he was feeling, because he figured God would see right through it anyway. He looked around the little arbor with a trellis, and in the midst of Last year's ivy remains, he saw some of the first of the new buds of spring. It seemed as if he could see them straining to get closer to the sun. It seemed as if they were saying, look at me, a new life, a new creation. And he realized in the little bud, there was potential that needed nurturing and the power of the sun to make it a thing of beauty. The hardest lesson that J.C and maybe the rest of us have to learn, is trusting God with the details to take our problems or questions, no matter how big or small, turn them over to God, then walk away from them. And then being able to discern, to understand God's answer when it comes, in whatever form. J.C. didn't say, Dear God, or Our Father. He didn't consciously pray the way we expect someone to pray. But as the thoughts ran through his mind, as they usually did, all helter-skelter, J.C. felt them slow down. And as his mind slowed down, the agitation of his body slowed as well, and he sat more relaxed in Mrs. Hampton's garden. Did he see a sign? Did he see a heavenly image like a hologram in front of him? Did the bush with the new buds burst into flame and a voice announce, I am God? God can do those things, but mostly he likes to deal with us like he is a loving father and we're his children, because that's what we are. So J.C. slowed down and relaxed and felt calm and peace, and he knew without the shadow of a doubt that he and Ruth 
and Jill would live together happily forever. It didn't matter if it was in Prophetstown or Pine Grove or Van Buren or any other town. What mattered was that they would be together doing God's work. And he knew as certain as he knew that bud would blossom, that he now knew how to do God's work because he had been taught by a master. J.C. has finally learned the most important lesson that Pastor James had to teach, that it's all in God's hands. And the best we can do is acknowledge that and then work hard to help each other through this life. Does the Reverend Mr. J.C. remain in Prophetstown? As you can see, when J.C. finally realizes that what matters most is not the position he is given, but the alignment of his heart, then he can accept whatever happens. And yes, the book does have a happy ending. But wait, there's one more reading session. In it, I'd like to introduce you to the sequel, which includes J.C. and many of his friends you already know. Its title is Old Songs, New Tunes. And I'll be reading it right here soon on Washington Free Public Library's YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. I'm Dave Stouffer.